most of you probably know the story, but the, the younger son, he asked his father to give him his inheritance. And when he did this, this was, this was really a, a slap in the face to his father. Like it was it pretty much what he was telling his father is that I, I want you to die because I want to receive the inheritance that you have for me. And this, there's so much more to this than just him taking this inheritance. What, what the inheritance actually meant was this was his legacy. This was his, this was his insurance. This was his social security. Like in that day, they had a patriarchal um, structure that villages were really built around. And within that was, it was where, it was where your, your safety came from. It was where your legacy came from. And for, um, <clears throat> for this son to go to his father and say, give me. And if you kind of read the language there, it's pretty strong. He's like, he says, hey, give me this inheritance. And this is, this is a huge slap in the father's face. It's a huge slap where he is saying like, hey, I, I pretty much want you dead. And that when, obviously, when a father would give his children their inheritance, this would be towards the end of, I mean, this obviously would be towards the end of their life or after they've passed away. And so this father, this son is communicating to his father. And this would have been a huge embarrassment to his father because the community would have known this. This obviously was a man that was, that was wealthy, was a man that was well-known and had influence. And for him to go to his father and do this, this was going to be an embarrassment to his father. And so his father, you know, this isn't where he just goes and he sells his mutual funds and writes and gives his son a check. I mean, the, the father owns animals, he owns land, he owns crops. And so the whole community would have seen him go and sell everything that he, he is going to give to his younger son. And he goes and he sells it all. And everybody would have seen that. And then he goes and he gives it to his son. And, and this was supposed to be a responsibility that the son takes on. Like inheritance was actually meant to be a responsibility that the son, that sons would carry on and they would carry on the father's name, they would carry on the legacy, and they would help grow the community and help provide for the community. And so the son goes and he, he squanders it. He goes to a dis- distant country. And we know that this is a, a Gentile country because he's, he talks about him being among the pigs. And <clears throat> he goes and squanders everything that the Father has given him. And here's what's interesting, is that village would have had elders. And the elders would have, they would have rejected this son. They would have completely rejected this son. There's even a whole ceremony, if you go research this, there's a whole ceremony that if this son goes and and loses his inheritance and squanders it amongst Gentiles, and he ever wanders back to the village the, vill- the village elders would have taken him to the center of the village, and they would have, there's a ceremony that they do, and they would have turned their back completely on this son. They would have turned their back on him, and they would have excommunicated him from the village. And the son, as he's out squandering what he has, eventually he squanders everything. And it says that he, he comes to his senses. And it's interesting because at this moment... I don't think the son actually repents at this time. Like at this time, it just says that he comes to his senses. And if you you read through the the verses there, what pretty much happens is, is he's out of food and he's hungry. And this is more of a logistical move for the son where he's like, "I, I am hungry. And he's thinking about his father's village, his father's family. And he's thinking about how even the hired hands, even the servants, have more to eat than I do right now. And, he, and so for him, he's coming to his senses, and, but I don't think he actually repents. And one of the reasons why I don't think this is, and I think the Pharisees, they would have known this, that there is a, um, a verse that he, he uses, that Jesus actually uses in this. <clears throat> I might see if I can find it. Here's what he says. Here's what the son says. He says, when I came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back 
to my father and say to him, Father, here's what he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. The, the phrase that he uses here, that Jesus uses, is, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. That phrase is a direct phrase from what Pharaoh said when he was standing before Moses. And I believe if you look at it, it's when uh, the plague of the locust had come and it says the whole earth was like, it looked like the whole ground was covered dark because of the locusts that were on the ground. And Pharaoh actually says, he says this exact phrase, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. And if you go back and read that story, I probably even could ask you guys, everybody in here knows that Pharaoh didn't actually repent. Like they know that he didn't repent. And Jesus uses that, communicating to the Pharisees that the son at this moment had not repented yet. He doesn't say anything like, oh man, I've hurt the relationship with my father, I've done something wrong. All he says is he's come to his senses and he realizes that the people back, back, the hired servants in my father's house actually have food to eat and I have nothing to eat. And so for him, this is a logistical move. But here's the deal, is this son, you can see, he's, he's rehearsing what he is going to say to his father when he gets back home. And I can only imagine that this son, that he is on this journey back to the village, and what he is expecting to see, what he's expecting to be greeted with is punishment. So he's coming back to the village, and I can only imagine that he's nervous, that he's scared, that he's rehearsing what he's going to say to his father, and he's on his way back to the village, and he's expecting the elders to take him before the community and pretty much excommunicate him. But his hope, he's got this, this hope in his heart that just maybe my father would let me just be a servant in his house. I think about us sometimes in our own walk with God, how we want to be servants, how we don't fully accept being a son of God and how we're thinking like, you know what, I've messed up because of my shame, because of the decisions that I've made in my life that I'm going to go work for my worth. And this is the idea that the son has that maybe if I can just go prove to my father, if I can just go climb up the ladder, if I can show him and go work again and try to go build my worth for myself and prove to my father that I am lovable. If I can go show him that, hopefully I can just get back to my father and I can meet him before the elders come and grab me and I can build back value for myself. You know what's fascinating about this story, if you go through and read it? It says that the father saw the son way off. Like it says he saw the father. You know what that tells us? That tells us that the father was waiting to see the son. Like he was looking out with eyes of compassion with eyes of love, he was waiting to see his son. Like he was just wait, he, he was sitting there with eyes of love, looking at the distant country. You know, one of the reasons why was because I think he knew that if he could catch his son before the elders did, then I could save him. That I, I want to catch my son before the community does. And I am looking, I'm waiting for my son. And you know what it says that he did? It says that he ran towards his son. In that day, patriarchs did not run. In that day, just boys would run. And so the father, him, for him to run towards his son was a public humiliation of himself. And he was, he would have, you know, they would have had those long things on and he would have had to hold his, his, his little skirt up and he would have taken off running. And I think to, to, for him to expose his legs was an act of humiliation. And so this was an act of him in front of the whole village, in front of the whole community, he sees his son and he runs in an act of humiliation. You know what he does? This is, this is such a picture of the cross of Jesus for us, is that he humiliated himself for us. And what did he do? Just like the, the father in this story, he runs towards the son and he stops the judgment. How many of you know that on the cross, the charge of sin has been removed from us. So what did he do? The father runs towards the son. He runs towards the son to greet him before the elders of the community can get to him. And what is he doing? He's humiliating himself. And I think in this moment, as the, the son, 
is starting to come over the hill, if you will. And he sees the father humiliating himself, running towards him. And he grabs him before the elders, before the village can get him. Because see, the, the, the elders will follow the father's lead. The elders will take whatever the father's doing, and they will, because of their loyalty and their respect of the patriarch, they'll honor what he does. And so this son, he comes running, and I think this is, this is the moment where true repentance starts to happen. Because something powerful happens in us when we see the pain that we caused in the relationship. You know, something I do with our kids is that, it, you know, a lot of times they'll be roughhousing, playing, got two, three boys, and our two oldest will start playing, and it's always fun in games at first. They're hitting each other, wrestling around, you know, within about four seconds, somebody's hurt. You know, within a, it doesn't take long, and then all of a sudden somebody's crying and somebody's hurt. And something that I, I heard a psychologist say this, so I, I was like, that must be a good idea, so I'll try it. And um, somebody that I do respect. Um, and... Uh, and he said, you know, off, he was, just said when he was raising his kids, if one of them would hurt the other one, he would always get the one that hurt the other one to look at, what it, to look at the impact that he had on his brother. And so I'll get my sons, the one, you know, Johnny hits wit, wits upset. And so I'll get Johnny to just, hey, son, I just want you to see. Do you see, do you see wit? You see how he's crying? You see how you impacted him? Like you're a powerful person. And the choices that you make have impact on people. And right now, it's not, not trying to judge you or condemn you or anything. I just want you to see that you, you have impact on people. And I think that's one of the things that the cross reveals to us. The, the, the pain and the beating that Jesus went through reveals to you and me the impact that our sin had. Like when we see what Jesus went through because of the sin because of our sin, because of the fall, like he is showing us an open act of humiliation, not to condemn us, but to show us the pain and the hurt and the trauma and all that that our sin has caused. And there's just something when you see that and you experience that. And I think the, the, the younger son, I think he would have experienced that as he's coming across, he sees his father and humiliating himself, I think in that moment he would start to realize, I think it, at first he was unaware of the impact that he was having on his father. And he started to realize that I've broken this relationship that I have with my father. And I think it's in that moment that true repentance starts to happen. You know what's interesting about the story is that the, the son begins to say a script. He starts to say, he starts to say it, and then all of a sudden the father doesn't let him finish it. Like you can tell, like he doesn't finish the whole thing that he had worked up in the scripture, and he doesn't finish it. And the father quickly grabs, it says that he grabs his best robe. And he grabs the best robe. Like this is the robe that, like this would have been, this would have been the father putting this robe on his son. And you know who would have seen that? Everybody else in the village. Everybody else in the village would have seen this son who has squandered, who has been out with the Gentiles, who has wasted the inheritance that actually impacted all of us. Like, yeah, we had to sell some of the sheep. You know, we had to sell some of the land. We, we don't have as much as we used to. But I am putting on, I am, I am putting on him my best robe. And when they go to that banquet that night, everybody would have seen this son wearing the best robe. And then he gets the ring, the signet ring of the family. And he puts the ring on the son. And this just signifies that like you, you are back in the family. You're back in the inheritance. You have restored yourself back into. You are no longer out there and out of bounds, but you are back in, reconciled to the family. And then it says that he puts on sandals. And some of the things that I've read about that time is that only like the sons would wear sandals, that like, maybe like the hired servants or the slaves wouldn't wear shoes. So this would signify that, again, that he's a son. And then it says that he got the fattened calf, which is just awesome because this would have been the calf. This would have been like the best piece of meat. This would have been what the father saved for a special occasion. And everybody in the, fa the village, everybody in the family knows that we've got a fattened calf. And this thing, when we get this thing out, it's a special meal. And this goes all the way back to what are the Pharisees grumbling about? They're grumbling because he's eating 
with the sinners and the tax collectors. They're upset. They're offended, and understandably so. I don't know if I communicated this, but the Pharisees had this worldview that it, their, their whole world was built around the text and obedience to God. And so in, where Jesus spent a lot of his ministry was in Galilee, which was Pharisaic villages. This is where the Pharisees were. And at the center of their villages would have been a synagogue, and at the center of the synagogue would have been the text. And these guys were devoted to the Scripture. They were devoted. These guys, I've said this many times, but they would have run circles around us by how much they know the Bible. I mean, these guys were devoted because they believed that the first temple was destroyed because the people of Israel didn't obey God. And so their thought was, is like, if we're going to obey God, then we have to know the text. We've got to know the text. If we're going to be able to know how to obey God, and their belief was, is that if we can obey God and we can live right and obey the text and know the text, then God will deliver us from Rome. God will take care of Rome. God will set us free. And so they had this worldview. And in this worldview, when they looked at the tax collectors and the sinners, they were like, you're what's wrong with the, you're what's wrong with the world. Because if you guys, if you guys would, would obey God, if y'all would know the text and study, then God would deliver us and set us free. And here comes Jesus. And here comes the Father, the perfect Father. And I believe that this is at the heart of what this parable is all about, is that it says that the Father had compassion. When he saw his Son, when he saw the one that had squandered everything, it says that the Father had compassion. And I, I believe, I shared this last week, but I think it's so true that I, I don't know that Jesus was necessarily upset with them that they knew the text and were trying to obey God. You know, that's probably a good idea. But I do think that in their devotion, in their passion, they had lost compassion. They had actually lost the heart of God. They had lost, and, and Jesus is coming and showing us and revealing to us what true compassion looks like. He's the perfect Father. And I, I just think about us and our community as we're about to step into a new land and a new place. That we get to go show the compassion of God in a land. That we get to go love the lost. That I think every single one of us that there's probably people that we know that are lost, that don't know God, that have wandered off. You know what one of the most interesting things to me about this text is, about this, is that the Father actually gave him the inheritance. You ever thought about that? About how, like, I would have thought that the Son, when he told the Father that, I'll give me my property, give me my estate, he probably would have expected, the Pharisees would have expected the story to go to refusal and punishment. Like, no, I'm not going to give this to you. But the Father actually gives him the inheritance because God, I think this is fascinating to me, is that sometimes it's the best thing that can teach us is the consequences of the decisions that we're making. That sometimes the God could have strong-armed him in this story. The Father could have said, no, I'm not going to let you go. I'm going to protect you. I'm going to protect you from a bad decision. I'm going to protect you from messing your whole life up. But the father said, wait, actually, I'm going to go sell everything. Not everything, but I'm going to go sell your, your portion, and I'm going to give it to you. You ever think about that? Like, how, like, not only did he not control him from making a bad decision, but he also, in, in some way, almost empowered it. He let him go. He didn't take away his freedom. And you know what else he didn't do? He didn't hurt the relationship. The son did, but the father didn't. The father still says, hey, I love you. I'm still here. I love you so much that I'm actually not even going to try to control you or manipulate you. I'm even going to let you go run into yourself. And sometimes in life, I can only imagine, I think about my own life and how I walked away from God for a season of my life. You know what? I needed to run into myself <laughs> in some ways. Would have been better not to walk away, sure. But in walking away, like I came, to, I was able to have a moment where I was able to come to my senses and realize the goodness of God. And this is what the son did, is at some point he starts to come to his senses. And I believe that the father trusted who he was. He trusted the goodness of God. 
in the sun at some point as he squanders everything and he makes bad choices. And I mean, there's a lot to learn in there about choices and consequences. And sometimes consequences are the best teachers for us. And as we raise our children, they're learning how to make good decisions and learning that there's good consequences and bad consequences. But in this, we just see the goodness of God and we see the compassion of a father that he was willing to empower and he was willing to let his son go because he trusted his goodness. He trusted that one day the son would want his goodness. And I've seen this in my extended family. <clears throat> and I just believe that God's compassion is in the room today. That his compassion, you know, the son, it, when he comes back home and, and he all of a sudden is comes to the realization that he doesn't have to work for his worth, that he just receives it by grace. That he, he didn't have to go and become a hired hand and work himself back into love. He didn't have to go prove himself. He didn't have to go get himself right and clean himself up. And No, the Father just came and put the big robe on him. And this will continually communicate to this young son that I don't have to have the fear of punishment that I don't have to work for my value or my identity, but I am a son of God because of what Jesus has done for me. And I think that's a message that's always kind of in there, is that we get to receive this amazing grace because of what Jesus has done for us. And that every single one of us, we get to become children of God, that we get to put on the big robe and the ring and the sandals and eat the fattened calf. And what is the Father communicating to the Pharisees in this? Again, He's saying, look, not only am I eating with them, but I'm getting the biggest meal, best meat that I can. And I'm eating with this child that has walked away because I love him, because I'm for him and I'm not against him. If you're able, can you stand with me? <clears throat> I am going to have our ministry team come up if you're on our ministry team. <clears throat> and our team's going to be up here. If, if you need a, a miracle in your body or you just want to respond to the message today, I want to love for you to come and, and, and if you need an encouraging word or prayer or anything like that, our team's here to pray for you. But I just want to pray over us today. The compassion of God. God, I pray that we would understand who you are. God, that we would have even a greater understanding of the compassion of the Father. And God, I pray that we would take on the mission of heaven to find what is lost, to find what is, what is missing. And God, I pray for even us as a community, God, that we would have a heart for the lost, that we would have a heart in our own lives for those things, for those people, those souls that don't know you that have walked away from you. And God, I pray that even in this atmosphere, Lord, if there's people that we should reach out to or call or love or send a text to or just love on somebody, I pray, Father, for that, that, Lord, we would even leave this place and we would make the call or text somebody or love somebody. God, I pray that we would be people that seek out what is lost. And Father, I pray that in this meeting, in this morning, Father, Lord, we would be reminded of the compassion of the Father of your love for us and that we are sons and daughters of God because of what you did. That we all, as children, we're all those children that get to put on the robe, get to put on the ring and eat the fattened calf.